Hey everyone, it's Dr. Romani here at our Promised Live. I've started these again. So, you know, you actually, I, I realized if the world wanted to mess with me, now they could keep buying the book because as long as people keep buying the book and this book stays on the list, I'm going to keep doing these lives and these raffles. So this is yours. I mean, if actually if you were like, we're just going to try to work hard and make her keep doing this. That's one way to do it because as long as we are, we're, we're hitting this list, we're going to keep doing the raffles and the lives and the Q and A's and everything's going to stay the way it is. Cause again, I'm going to keep my promise. So welcome to today's live today. I'm going to, I have a bunch of different topics. I'm going to talk about some that are from you and some that have actually come up in some interesting conversations I've had in the last couple of days. Actually, I wish you could see this big mess of notes I have in front of me because there are all these things that have happened since yesterday evening and today. And I'm like, oh, these are actually worth all talking about. So I'm going to talk about some of those, but I also want to, you know, we're going to do questions. So as you're, as I'm talking, questions may come up. You may have questions you want to toss in there. So we're going to do that. And then again, I'm going to remind everyone, like I said, I'm not, I'm not kidding. We, each week we were on the list. I really did not think this week was going to happen. So I was like, Ooh, we better make sure we got all the stuff and the time and all that that's happening. So more five more teas with Dr. Romney being raffled, more book boxes, more signed books, all that stuff is, um, we're, we're continuing to raffle that stuff off. So um, book boxes, everything, those are all going to be raffled. Now, if you've already ordered a book, pre-ordered a book, you're back from December and all those times, you're still on that raffle list. So you don't, it's not like these are every week you have to recreate this, but if you're new to this party, you might say like, oh, I heard about this book. I want to get it. Oh, I can still get some giveaways. You sure can. Not only were each time you order the book, each separate book order is a separate raffle entry. You'll also be, um, a, you'll get access to our six hour live retreat, which is happening some point in May. And that again, it, it's a, it's virtual, but it's happening in real time. And if those of you can't make that date, don't worry, it'll all be made available to you. Um, you know, after the fact as a recording, you just have to register for what we call verify your purchase. And there's links to do that either in the bio on Instagram or in the notes for the video. And those of you who are saying like, oh, I, I got, I would love to give this, you know, give this book as a gift. This is the time to do it because you're still getting these raffle entries and stuff. Again, at some point, this poor book is going to get tumbled down and we won't do this anymore. But while we're, while it's happening, we're going to keep it alive. You're keeping it alive. Really. It's 30% off on Amazon still. So you're getting it for a pretty decent discount. I think it's coming out to like maybe 20 bucks in the U S so it's, it's not that bad. So, I mean, it is, it is not that bad. I can't, it's not fair for me to assume, but listen, some, like I said, some of you might, might be wanting to do gifts or donations or whatever. This would be the time to do it while we're still, while we're still keeping things going. Now it's kind of like a really like, let's, can we keep this going? Let's see. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to stick to my side of what I said I would do. So again, they, this, if you have not bought the book yet and you still wanted to get some of our giveaways, it's not too late. This all goes until the end of the day, March 16th at midnight. Okay. So March 16th at midnight in your time zone. So if you're in New York, it's midnight in New York. If you're in Chicago, midnight, Chicago, LA, midnight in LA and other parts of the world, the same. So just so you know that that's how that's being done. Let's see where it gets us folks. You, I mean, so far I've been nothing but impressed by you and your willingness to sort of read it, talk about it, review it, share your thoughts with me. It's been, it's been really quite remarkable. So let's talk about a couple of things that have come up. Cause I think these are all things like when I hear things that make me sit up straighter and say, Oh, that's a very clarifying point. I always want to make sure that I, I share, share it with the community. And again, I will be answering questions. So as I'm talking, you might come up with questions. Um, and also if you, um, you might already have questions you have queued up. So go ahead and drop those in. So let's talk about a couple of different things here. All right. One thing is, there's, there's a combination here. That one thing that happens for people in narcissistic relationships, especially when it's early days, and those of you who might be relatively new to this, or you might even look back to when you first started sort of recognizing what this was, is that we have these thoughts, what just simply thinking someone's narcissistic sometimes feels like we're being a bad person, or that we don't want to be bothered with them anymore, or we do not want to listen to their victimhood, or they, they sort of set it up. Narcissistic parents can do this a lot, but frankly, any narcissistic relationship can do this. They sort of set it up that if we are not doing things for them, like literally taking time out of our workday or not spending what little bit of downtime we have with them or neglecting other responsibilities we have to do things for them, they'll tell us we're selfish, that we're ungrateful, that we're greedy, that we're all kinds of terrible things. 
hear that enough, you believe it yourself. And then you might even think it is true of yourself. Like maybe I'm not a nice person. And this is one of the struggles with that idea of boundaries and narcissistic relationships. You know, I think that the boundaries conversation when we, when it comes to narcissistic relationship is messed up because you're not setting boundaries with the narcissistic person. The boundaries are really sort of an extension of radical acceptance of what really that this, what's not going to happen here. But what, what does happen is we do what might be considered sort of mild boundaries. At, at a minimum, we don't interact with them as much, right? As soon as you start seeing what this is, you're like, I am not doing this anymore, right? So we don't. And then what happens is because we're not doing what they want all the time, they're noticing. And they're like, oh, well, you're so, you're, you're so mean, or you guess you're too important for me, or again, whatever rant they're going on, um, or you get cut out of activities, you get, you get labeled awful, but you may yourself feel like a bad person. I've had many, many people over the years say, am I an awful person? Am I a terrible person? Like, is, is this mean thing to do to a parent who's older? Or is this a rotten thing to do to my brother whose life isn't going the way that he wants? Like, is this, a, or like my ex keeps sniffing around and we've been split up for a while, but I kind of feel bad for the person. Like many times your empathy, your compassion, your willingness to take pity on someone ends up really kind of, it's like a boomerang. It comes back and smashes you in the head because it's a, you feel like you're a bad person. And feeling like a bad person can make it really difficult to do anything that resembles anything. I don't even want to call them boundaries to disengage in these relationships. At the same time, something else happens, which is also really problematic, which is when people, and I've, I've, I've had this happen over the many, many years um, of doing therapy with clients going through this, is they feel as though thinking about someone close to them, especially parents, family members, spouses or partners, adult children are narcissistic is it's though they're betraying them. They're betraying the narcissistic person by viewing them as narcissistic. Again, going back to that idea of, I think I'm a bad person and I don't want to spend time with them and I don't even want to call them and I don't want to return their calls and I don't want to do stuff for them. I just want them to leave me alone, but I feel like a bad person. And by even considering or thinking that their behavior is narcissistic or manipulative or gaslighting or whatever it is, I'm betraying them. And this is this is a sort of a thought loop that people in narcissistic relationships get stuck in quite a bit because then you're back to this idea of you're the bad one. And you might even be able to say, well, I'm not saying that their behavior is good, but now I feel like I'm as bad as them. And so now you've put yourself sort of in on the same shelf as them and it makes it harder to heal because in a way you don't want to individuate because you think you're a rotten person. This is something so unique in these narcissistic relationships that the, your willingness to call this behavior out as a problem leaves you feeling as though you're a bad person and that you're even betraying this person. And it can push people back into the shadows to not get help, to not talk about it, all of that. So I just, that's something that came up in multiple, multiple conversations. And now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to kind of be talking about some disjointed points here because a lot of people were, um, you know, a lot of I'm having a bunch of different conversations. Here's another one I want to talk about. In all these various interviews and podcasts and everything I'm doing and, and thinking about um, as we talk about this book, when we talk about healing, right? And healing kind of fall, follows a sequence is identify it, radically accept it, experience that grief that follows the radical acceptance. As that grief slowly starts to work its way through, you're able to take those realistic expectations and put them into action. You make decisions about whether you're going to stay, go. But really what we're talking about when it comes down to brass tacks is what comes after grief is disengagement. Because that's really the only path forward. It doesn't matter what kind of narcissistic relationship you're in, the nature of the relationship. It's all about disengagement. And I think using one term and again, calling it a continuum might help make sense of what feel like very disjointed elements of this. Not all of you can leave, not all of you want to leave and not, nor do you have to, to heal. If you can, if you can view even staying in the relationship or leaving the relationship as forms of disengagement, it can help a lot. Now, obviously the most extreme form of disengagement is no contact. Right. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's obviously that's it. That's the sledgehammer of disengagement because you have nothing to do with them. And like we said, this is a strategy 
that's not available to everyone. It's very difficult in families. It's impossible if you have minor children and you're co-parenting, right? So that's really the no contact. I, you, you cannot find me. I am not talking to you. I have disappeared. It is, again, and for some people, they'll say, even if they kind of, quote unquote, could no, go no contact, it feels uncomfortable to them. And that doesn't mean that you're a doormat or a codependent. It just doesn't, it doesn't work for everyone. And while I think a lot of people tout no contact as the answer, it's, it's, it's a, an answer. It's not the answer. And it's probably the most extreme form of disengagement. And it's, it's also stipulated that you are leaving that relationship too, right? As we, so as we keep coming on the, on this continuum of, of disengagement, then there are those cases where you may end the relationship, but you still have contact. And that might be gray rocked contact, which like I said, I'm not a fan of gray rocking in person. I think it feels abrupt. I think it feels cold. I think it makes the gray rocker look a little bit odd. I love gray rocking and writing, you know, that text messages that are tight emails that go right to the point, like not a lot of superfluous. You need to click the thing to make the whole damn text fill the page nonsense, right? So that's what I mean by gray rocking works there. Yellow rocking, Tina's term works a lot better where there's a little bit more of you, a little more emotion. You might ask about the weather, that kind of stuff, but not get into anything else. And then there are those sort of firewalling kinds of approaches, things like not sharing good news, not sharing bad news, sticking to the weather, um, not sharing vulnerable things, you know, taking those to other places first. So those are all forms of disengagement that that can work even if even if you leave the relationship and certainly if you stay in the relationship. As you stay in the relationship, again, those levels of disengagement are often all those things I talked about, especially the yellow rocking and the firewalling stuff. But if you were to really say like at a minimum, if you could not at least stop not engaging with the baiting, that would be probably probably the most baseline level of dis disengagement and just not getting into the back and forth with them. I will tell you that uh, because when we found out about the New York Times list yesterday, um, I think in my excitement, like I was like, I cannot believe this happened. And I had to do a bunch of things. I was busy at the time the news came out. And so then I, I was telling people, but I made the mistake of telling some folks where I knew, I knew, I knew the answer was not going to be such a, like, it was sort of like, oh gosh, you again, kind of thing. And, um, and I'm like, Romani, you knew. And you did it anyhow. And you know what it was? I was just not being mindful. I was actually doing, I was running to the grocery store and I was quickly parking my car and I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I want to tell folks like, and now it's after four, I could tell them. And then I slipped and I told one of the people who just was, you know, who, who immediately turned it into an icky direction. In a way, it's like that bucket of cold water that we may chronically get thrown in our face as we continue to navigate the narcissistic relationships that we don't leave. I don't necessarily think it was a bad thing. At first it stung, but then I thought, you know what, this is a good reminder. I'm like, girl, you got to be more mindful. You know who you can take this to. This wasn't the right person. It took a little bit of, out of the wind out of my sails for the rest of that day, which is fine because I had to end up doing other work that whole day anyhow. So maybe I didn't need that wind. But my point is that if we view healing, that, that next phase of healing after grief as this sort of continuum of disengagement that can be as simple at the lowest ends of disengagement. And then also, we also have the not going deep. Don't defend, don't explain, don't um, engage, don't personalize. Don't explain. Yeah. Don't engage, don't personalize. Those are sort of like also in coming into those, that, that mid-level of disengagement, right? Um, obviously at the absolutely non-existent level of disengagement, you continue to engage with them left and right. And you continue to have the same conversations that go nowhere. You may not, and, and you may not have fully radically accepted at that point. That's that continuum. That, the, the, the higher up you can get onto that continuum, and I kind of put no contact by itself because I don't, I by no means think it's essential for healing. Usually the better you get, but here's one thing I want to tell you about disengagement. I don't want you to set an unrealistic bar for yourself. Let's say you're like, okay, this, whoever this person is in my life is narcissistic. Oh my gosh, this isn't going to change. Okay. I read the book. Mm, this is unsettling. Right. And then you go through the grief, you go through the loss, you go through that sense of that loss of hope. This isn't going to get better, all that stuff. And then you slowly start coming out of that and say, okay, and you shift your expectations, but you, then you, you manage this whole, this spectrum of discernment. You may, you, you may be thinking to yourself, I'm just grateful that I am able to not uh, take the bait. And that's where I'm going to stick for a while. That's actually great. 
you do not need to get all the way to sort of advanced level yellow rock, not sharing good news. That takes a minute to get to. You're sort of, it, it, all of these discernment strategies, you're sort of seeing what the relationship can tolerate, what gets you into weird corners, and then you take it out so you can really be in this relationship in a way that you see it fully realistically and approach it with that knowledge, okay? So I just wanted to give you that, that sort of sense of that continuum of dis disengagement. Then there was another, again, unrelated point, but I really want to come to it. As you know, that one of the reasons I wrote this book was so many people weren't being supported in their experience of narcissistic abuse. And sadly, one of the places that it was happening was in therapy. One of the things that people in therapy were encountering, especially couples therapy, was that, and, and even in individual therapy, when they're talking about a relationship and it still hasn't been sort of pegged as a narcissistic relationship where you are starting to recognize that maybe it was, is that you might be sharing a experience of rage that the narcissistic person in your life is having yelled at you, screamed at you, tantrumed at you, silent treatment you, however they show their rage, right? And the person you're talking to, it may or may not be a therapist, it could just even be a friend, and they ask you this question, because this is a question that messes up, messes with a lot of survivors' heads, and it's an unacceptable question. So you tell them this person showed you the rage. There's a right question to ask, and there's a wrong question to ask at that point. The right question for me or anyone else to ask you in that place would be, um, the way they raged at you, that, that wasn't okay. Are you okay? I'm so sorry that happened to you. A recognition that that silent treatment, that tantrum, that rage fest was not okay. That's it. That's where we begin. But the disrespectful question that so many people get asked is, what did you say? What did you say to set them off? And I'm thinking, oh, that's great. So this person has behaved in a way that's utterly unacceptable. And we turn it into, what did you say? Especially when we know the person. And we know that they're not, like they're not poking and prodding and getting and insulting. That many times you might have simply said like, hey, can we move a little quicker? We're going to be late to the kid's school. And then that's what you had to endure. But when we, when we contextualize the narcissistic, the acting out rageful behavior as, well, let's understand it by what set it off. You start to see why so many folks, almost everyone who goes through this, blames themselves. Because forget the trauma bonding and the cognitive dissonance. That's bad enough. Obviously, that's what's happening to us internally. But if the questions that are coming at us is, well, what did you say to make that happen? It's as though the person asking you that simply can't believe that someone would believe would behave in such an abusive, rageful way. Well, wake up and get your hell out of the hell out of Candyland. Like this is how people behave. And acknowledge that versus, well, come on, well, what did you say? Because someone wouldn't just do that. Sure they would if they have this personality style. And if this has happened to you, I am so sorry. And I'm sure it probably has. It's happened to all of us. Because we're given us, we're, we're sort of, everyone's trying to say, well, nothing happens in a vacuum. Oh, actually, with personality, it kind of does. And I would say, but people say, well, like, maybe I'm partly responsible. What? Because you were standing there? That doesn't make you responsible. So I really want to highlight that because when you're asked that question, it may leave you to question, lead you to question yourself. With already that existing self-doubt and self-blame, you might say like, well, maybe I didn't have the right tone or maybe I shouldn't have said, let's go. And I should have been more chill and been okay that we were going to be late to our kids' performance, even though they were the first performer in the show. But maybe I should have been okay with that, right? So you, you end up getting trained in this sort of, maybe I should be okay with all this terrible, disappointing stuff as long as I don't set off the narcissistic person. Absolutely not. So I wanted to just sort of say, lay out some of that stuff. Now, again, think about your questions too, because I'm going to be getting to those in a, in a, in a little bit. But I also want to um, go back to some of the questions that folks had been, um, that had been asking that they would love to see covered in some of these lives. And I want to make sure I get into some of that. One of the pieces was around this idea of narcissism and enmeshment. Okay. So enmeshment is where we see what we call the fancy word for this is sort of these undifferentiated boundaries. In enmeshed systems, or typically families, people are basically getting up in your grill all the time. That's sort of the non-technical. And so what we see is that when systems are enmeshed, there's a lot of intrusiveness. There's people asking inappropriate questions. There's 
<coughs> there's people who sort of feel they have the right to comment on your on your weight, on your health, even do it in front of other people. Like there's just a, there's a lot of those violations. There's a, there's a sense that everyone, you're all adults. So keep in mind, this would even be people who are adults. Like they have the right to know everything about your life, including private matters. And if you don't share them, then you're being difficult. Then you're the problem who is not being open or like that is though you're some somehow not some kind of team player in, in whatever this group is or family is. In more collectivistic cultures, you can see how enmeshment can almost, is that all, is it a given? It's not a given. Even in a collectivist culture, there can be space given to individuals in it, but enmeshment might be less likely to be called out in those systems. And mesh systems are often, often there are narcissistic people in those systems because the enmeshment kind of works for the narcissistic person and they kind of have a double standard around it. They feel they have the right to poke around in the other people's lives, right? That, that's, that's the end for them. They feel like they, they can expect you to always be there for them, do anything they want, almost like you should be able to almost magically sort of teleport to wherever they need you to be. That, that That's sort of how that shows up for them. They sort of feel entitled to what's going on in your life. However, they don't feel the same towards you. So if you were to expect a piece of information from them, they may not give it to you. And meshment with, with you have a narcissistic parent can also show up with inappropriate sharing of information, things that a child shouldn't have to hear or have to weigh in on and certainly in no position to give advice about. There's sort of an unseeing of developmental differences. There's an unseeing of proper roles. The problem with enmeshed systems, like I said, which invariably have at least one narcissistic person in them, they can be really difficult systems to leave. And when you think of the definition, it's this, it's all, everything's all sort of twisted uh, together. And that also, it, it twists up our identity. Like we almost can't figure out where we begin and the system and the family end. And that's how they want it. Because it's almost as though to... Uh, understand our own existence, we have to look towards them. That's a great example of what also happens in these enmeshed systems. So to try to become your own individual person who has your own wants, needs, aspirations, and sense of self, it's really difficult to do if you're in an enmeshed system because there's no willingness to recognize you as a separate person, which is exactly what happens in a narcissistic relationship. So narcissistic people like I said, they they kind of have this hypocritical double standard approach to enmeshment where they'll often keep enmeshed systems going because it'll kind of keep everyone sort of indoctrinated into a system where everyone almost has to always be available, especially to the narcissistic person, but they're not going to do that on their side. They're definitely not going to make them, they're, they're not going to always be available and, and meet everyone's needs. So I think that that's how those things go together. And I think it's part of why exiting a narcissistic family system or or disengaging from an, a narcissistic family system can feel so difficult because of how sort of sticky everything is. And some people will even say the family system was so enmeshed that when I finally did kind of disengage from it, I felt really lonely. And, and it would make sense because when you think of what an enmeshed system is, it's like 17 people in a small room, like it has that sort of physically, it has that feel. I'm not saying that you, you could be enmeshed in a, in a large space too, but I'm saying it has psychologically that feel of a bunch of people mushed into a small space and you're all kind of in each other's business and, and, and those things. But there's also sort of this psych, this psychological series of expectations that come from it and that any sense of separation or stepping away or making your own voice heard is disloyal in these systems too. And like I said, we're, it, it, enmeshment doesn't require narcissism. I want to say that now there are enmeshed systems that don't have narcissistic people present, but it definitely, it, um, it's not unusual for narcissistic people to construct or persist in enmeshed systems. And enmeshment, while we typically almost always use it to describe families, could it be a workplace? I think so, because I think the way some workplaces are run, there can be definitely a real sense of enmeshment and a difficulty that people feel, especially in a family business, would be a great example where even if everyone who works in the family business isn't a family member, the culture of that of that business can feel quite enmeshed. So is that. Um, another thing that had come up, and I think I gave a little bit of lip services to this in a live last week, but I'm going to revisit it here, is this idea of cultural behaviors and how do we contrast that to narcissism. 
it gets to be very, very complicated. In fact, I just had a conversation with this about someone tomorrow, or yesterday, I should say yesterday, about a, um, a lecture I'm going to be giving in the next few months in, in different parts of the world. And it gets kind of funky because in certain cultures, like again, a much more hierarchical structure of a family may exist, right? That it may be that some of the expectations would be that a male family member speaks for the whole family and other people are, are supposed to remain quiet, right? So that might be a culturally expected kind of a thing. Just because that happens doesn't necessarily mean that someone's narcissistic or the system's narcissistic, right? So you might have certain cultural practices, like I said, a male family member speaking for the family, but behind closed doors, that male family might, member might actually be empathic and might be hearing other people's point of view. And when they do present whatever they present to whomever they're presenting, they are presenting the, the perspectives of people in that family. They're a, they're a uh, trustable kind of representative of that family. But you can see though, when you have those structures, that there's a lot of public power invested in a specific member of a family just on the basis of something like gender. How, if that mixes up with narcissism, it gets really ugly very quickly. So those cultural patterns don't necessarily mean narcissism, but they're like a magnifier. If narcissism is present, that kind of cultural expectation then means that that narcissistic person is going to be able to run a lot more emboldened and roughshod, probably dominate the others in that family much more. And the people in that family system will not really have any voice to even get help and will be silenced by others who might say to them, well, you need to learn your place. So there's no sense of you get to individuate and be your own person in these systems, which again, when there's a narcissistic person in that midst, and that's the person who holds the power, it can get very, very messy. Now, obviously, this issue of culture is a lot more complicated than I could get into in a live in, in a live because there's so many sort of various pieces of it, and this is going to differ culture to culture to culture. But anytime that there is a system that's housing a lot of just sort of given power, not earned power or, or earned through respect, but just given power to someone in a family who then gets to sort of represent the family. When that mixes up with narcissism, it's invariably a disaster. Um, when it's not, then it's just how it works. I mean, we still may not like it, but um, it's not necessarily causing us harm, much harm to the people in, in that system. Um, and I think that we hit mo mo many of the things that you had asked me. Um, and then I'm going to make a comment about this because this came up. I realized I didn't say this. There's, there's this issue of reactive abuse. I don't love the term. I really, really don't, because again, it kind of it flies in the face of what I was just saying before. Is we've got to see what the whole what the whole context looks like, right? That they will say to someone, "What did you say to set them off?" Right? Reactive abuse is really defined as a person who is in a dyad is in a relationship of two, and even if the a one person, let's call this person narcissistic, is behaving in a way that's abusive or baiting or cruel. And the other person in the relationship who may not be narcissistic reacts very strongly and assertively and even aggressively that this behavior of this other person is called reactive abuse. Okay. Because the words coming out of their mouth may be critical, may be obscene, um, may be things that would qualify as abuse. The challenge with this framework is that then if you're going to do that and look at context, you better open up your lens really, really wide. So it's like one of those sort of panoramic shots. You don't just get to do a standard shot. Then let's take it all the way out. Because when we term something reactive abuse, what we often will do is focus on one interaction. But what we may not look at is at 100 interactions. And that 100, 100 interactions where someone was pushed and taunted and teased and mocked and devalued and insulted perhaps by the more antagonistic or narcissistic person, and the other person didn't react as strongly. But it begs the question, is there a point where any of us, if someone's going at us and betraying us and manipulating us, is there a point where any of us is going to show up in a way that would look like this so-called reactive abuse? I'll say personally, I have. In fact, seven months ago, I did. I was in an argument with someone and I had, I'd been going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with this person, keeping it together, keeping it together, keeping it together. And I lost it. And if all anyone did was capture that one interaction, they'd be like, 
Dr. Romney's a narcissistic abuse. Maybe not narcissistic abuse. Dr. Romney's is like her language is abusive, right? However, I had to say in the context of a hundred interactions with this person, one person said, why didn't you do this sooner? And I think that that's often the case in these so-called reactive abuse cases. You push anyone, the sanest, most peaceful, push anyone far enough, they're going to snap back. Either that or they've gone into such a numb, apathetic, almost harming themselves even more because they're not stepping up space. So it's the danger of that term is it's often bandied about in situations where people aren't looking at all of the react, all of the um, interactions between the people and don't have a fuller look at it. And what it does is in that one interaction where the person is reacting and the antagonistic person, you know, has probably always behaved like this. If we only look at that, yeah, I mean, it looks like they're reacting to that, but there's no sense of what led up to this moment. And when that gets captured, using that language against someone, it then makes them almost seem as though they're complicit in this. And that can leave a person being able to get absolutely no institutional help for years. This is how law enforcement would manage this and say, well, they're there. This is how I see the one's going at the other. And so it's, I don't like the term. I, I, I'll find another term. I, again, it's hard for me to even say it's not okay. Like this is sort of the downstream effect of when we stay in toxic antagonistic relationships. Somebody pokes and pushes too hard. We do sometimes clap back. Most people in narcissistic relationships are over-regulated, over-regulated, meaning that they don't express emotion and they don't push back and they don't yell back. That's the sort of the accumulated effect of a lifetime of being told you shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't be feeling, you shouldn't be sharing, right? But we do sometimes, and who knows, it might be the night we didn't get enough sleep. And, and people say, well, doesn't that apply to the narcissistic person too? No, because their pattern is more patterned. Reactive abuse tends to happen more episodically, not every single... Now, if it's every single time that two people are going at each other, I'd also want to ask the question about if both of them are going at each other, maybe both of them are antagonistic, both of them are dysregulated, that's a different conversation. But in cases of reactive abuse... In most cases, what's happening is this person often hasn't responded and then they do respond. And again, it's that over-regulation getting pushed for whatever reason it gets pushed. And because it's such a nuanced conversation and people want to use it as a quickie explanation, right? This, is, this gets pulled into family court all the time because everyone's recording everyone these days. And if you have someone who grabs up that one video where you were, your vo your volume went up, you now look like a reactive abuser. And make no mistake that if that's even allowed in, which it really shouldn't be, whoever's representing you, that that's it, that stuff, it just, it without context, it, it doesn't tell us anything. But it's a, and this is why even that whole argument about context is often why the word narcissism is not often to be, and brought into these conversations. But it's a very, I don't love the languaging. I think it, it leaves a lot out. I think we can use terms like dysregulated at this time. Um, reacted to what was happening, but the reactive abuse piece implies a, complic a, a complicity that we need a hell of a lot more data to determine, like I said, the consistency of that this is a response. But I know some of you have had, used that lang have had that languaging used against you. And it can, again, if you're at all skating on self-blame and self-doubt, it can really get very, very difficult. And then that takes us to this issue. The one of the last topics people have asked me to cover is this idea of post-separation abuse. I think I, I sort of hinted at this one in a live I did last week, but post-separation abuse is the, is the set of things that might happen after a person ends a relationship with a narcissistic person. And it doesn't matter who's ending it. It's much more likely to happen if you are the not narcissistic person and ending the relationship because it speaks to abandonment and loss of control by the narcissistic person. It may not be what they want. So it can be punitive, vindictive, taunting. It can be stalking. It could be um, smear campaigns. It can be any of those things. Some people will say the post-separation abuse was worse than the relationship and is actually gave them fear about ending it. And when they ended it, said, I shouldn't have done this. It would have been easier to stay in the mess the relationship was. In the long term, I don't know that they feel that way. But while the post-separation abuse is the most florid, they do.
Does it happen every time? It happens a lot of the time. I mean, I think it happens the majority of the time. It's again on a continuum, like all of these things. At the mildest end, it might be some angry texts and emails for a few weeks or months, and then they sort of uh, whittle away. Some of you might think, well, if they leave me, would there be post-separation abuse? Bizarrely enough, yes. So even though they're the one who decided to leave for whatever reason, especially if there's other stuff in play, money, assets like a car or a house, kids, it may happen. So even though they might have moved off into their own new story, whatever that is, they'll still come at you, which we, it's so confusing because you're like, okay, you left me and you're coming at me. But again, it's, it's, it's a volley for power. And that's a driver in these relationships. So those are the topics you asked for. So now I'm going to switch over to questions because I think we've hit all the topics you asked for. At the end of this live, I'm also going to say, if anybody has any topics you want me to cover in lives, please, please share them because we will. But do, does anyone have any questions? Kelly, if anyone has any questions. Okay, someone here is saying, can you ex please explain to me how come they don't feel shame when they gaslight, pretend they don't understand, twist your words, don't remember things, et cetera, things that an adult shouldn't do, but... I don't know what the but is, but how come they don't feel shame when they gaslight? We feel shame when we think we did something wrong. Okay. So if we, and sometimes the thing we think we did wrong, no one else would think was wrong, right? That's what's so strange about shame. It's a judgment we're putting on our behavior. So it doesn't matter that the behavior actually is wrong. It's that we think we did something wrong and that that was seen by someone else as wrong. Like a thought, like some people will say, oh my gosh, I'm so ashamed, Dr. Romney. I think my mother's narcissist. What kind of person would think that? That's an example of shame. Nobody, now I know because they told me, but up until then, they've been carrying the shame because they were thinking something. Now, in this case though, how, do they, how come a narcissistic person doesn't feel shame when they gaslight? Gaslighting isn't as, nobody decides to gaslight, okay? This is not as conscious a process as you would think. It's not like someone's like, okay, you, you over there, I'm going to destabilize you. I'm going to doubt your perceptions and memory and reality and, I'm them, and then I'm going to make you feel crazy. Yep, and then I'm going to destabilize you and then I'm going to go have lunch. That's not how this happens. That it is a, the motivations, our motivations are things that are chronically at play within us, right? For some folks, one would argue Dr. Romney is a strong motivation for achievement, right? Let's, are we going to keep the book on the list another week? Are we going to, you know, are, are, am I going to do my work? Blah, blah, blah. I've always been a, 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 a drive for achievement kind of person since I was a little kid. Okay. Part of that was a sort of trauma safety response because I thought it would make me loved. And now here it is. And it kind of runs the show for me. And it, it's very, it drives me right? For a person who's narcissistic, they're motivated by power, power, dominance, control, right? They're not aware of that. They don't wake up and before their feet hit the ground say, okay, power, dominance, and control, where are you going to take me today? It's not that. It's at any time that they feel disempowered in a situation, they're going to set that straight. And gaslighting becomes that play. It's natural for them. It's And it's also because you're willing to see someone as less than you, right? So that's inherent in them, that they can have contempt for another person, devalue them, have no care for them, and then have to keep power. I don't even think that they're willingly saying, I want to destabilize them. So like, I got to be the one who's in control. I've got to be the one who's in power. And so, and even that's not an active conscious process. It's that all of their behavior trains in that direction. Okay. So they don't feel shame because A, it's not happening at a conscious level and B, I don't, they don't think they're doing it. So it's hard to feel shame about something you don't think that you're doing. Right. And so the, all these things you're saying, they pretend they don't understand, they twist their words, that they don't remember things. These are all the things they're doing to maintain this almost delusional sense of perfectionism, grandiosity, better than other people, but it is not happening at an active level. And they are, um, it's all being driven by that need for power, control, and dominate. How high is the risk of spoiling a possible good relationship due to the, the emotional distress? Okay. So I'm going to make sure I'm reading this right. How high is the risk that you will spoil a possibly new good relationship due to the emotional distress about a formal, former relationship with a narcissist? <laughs> There's a risk. There's a risk. And the risk will come out in a few ways. One way is that you're second guessing and doubting yourself all the time. 
And people who are who have had previous narcissistic relationships may find themselves in a place where they feel like they need a lot of reassurance, right? Like, um, did I did I do that okay? Or like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? There's a lot of are you sure from people who are survivors of narcissistic relationships. So even a decent person, good person, would be like, oh my gosh, like this is getting exhausting. And they're not meaning meaning to be mean. How often do you want to reassure someone, right? It gets exhausting. So that's one place it can show up. There can also be a suspiciousness that the frequent betrayals of trust that come up in a narcissistic relationship can create in a new relationship. So we may have lots of struggles with trust and we may doubt the integrity of a new partner who's actually not doing anything. Now, again, with a proper backstory, a good person will say, okay, I get it. You were hurt, but there's limits on that. So if we keep doubting that integrity, and there's really not a lot to hang our hat on, it's that we're almost, we still haven't grieved that past or let go, I mean, grieved, but we still have fully haven't healed from that prior relationship. We may end up now projecting that onto the new partner that's healthy. But at there, again, it's like the reassurance. There's a point at which you're like, listen, I really like you, but the number of times you're, I can't, I'm not doing anything wrong and I'm not interested in spending my time proving this to you. There may also be an unwillingness to share, like to even now all that stuff you had to do in the narcissistic relationship to survive, not share emotions, not share hopes, not share of yourself. Well, that's necessary in a good relationship. And it's almost like a muscle we've lost. So that kind of emotional intimacy, that depth of intimacy is a new skill set that needs to be built. And if it's taking too long, like if there's a constant tentativeness or there's not as much sharing, that could potentially spoil a good relationship. Overlooking for red flags could potentially spoil a new good relationship. Listen, a lot of folks, when they first start dating after having been narcissistically abused, will say they did one thing and I, I, I jumped right on it. Now, while discernment is so important, I guess we could overcorrect and be quite discerning. Like a person comes three minutes late because they wanted to find a parking meter and they come in and they're like, you were three minutes late. And like, mm, you know, I mean, we got, we got to figure out what those, those limits look like. All of this though is why I, you know, I'm so, so clear on that need for that, um, for that, uh, What's it? Uh, sorry, my, I lost my words there. For that 12 month, um, what I call 12 month cleanse in the book, it's almost like a detox. 12 months of being single and on your own after a relationship. Because this is stuff when we're, when we're still going through the final bits of healing, we don't want to do this on the clock of a new relationship because we're still finding ourselves. And then we run the risk of potentially even getting into another unhealthy relationship. But a year on our own, figuring out who we are, our preferences, our needs, our wants, our rhythms, our sense of identity, our sense of autonomy, giving per uh, permission to our authenticity, clearing the decks of enablers, that takes a minute. And so there is a risk if you're not in therapy, haven't given yourself the time. And honestly, when a lot of people give themselves that year, it goes longer than a year. You know, but it's when people say, oh my gosh, a year feels like such a long time. It's actually, it is and it isn't, but a lot of good healing can happen in a year. And then with that good healing happening, you're like, I'm kind of enjoying where things are at versus a person who feels like I want to be in a new relationship. So I wouldn't say it's high, high risk, but there's some risk. And that's why ensuring that you're not, it's not just saying I've done the healing, but touching in with yourself and ensuring that you're mindful and not really having the new partner hold the bag of the sins of the prior narcissistic partner. Do we have any other questions? What about when the narcissistic person is a next door neighbor? Ooh, you and I must have lived in the same neighborhood, hon, because I had this happen once. This is a really, really good question. And it's don't underestimate it because next door neighbors can be very impactful, especially if you live in an apartment um, setting where it's even tighter corners or you have a shared fence or your windows are very close to each other. Neighbors are very impactful people that we do not choose and often have nothing to do with. They can wreak havoc with, they might feel like they're always monitoring us and they catch you on a sub like, oh, you've, you've parked in the wrong place or you put your trash can in the wrong place. N narcissistic neighbors are can be really, really problematic. Um, they may criticize you for making noise. They themselves may feel entitled to make all the noise and mess they want. And if you try to call them on it, we'll raise all kinds of havoc and rage. And in some cases, I've heard of cases where a narcissistic neighbor was dangerous. So 
all the rules apply. I mean, when you have a narcissistic neighbor, in some ways, there's actually a little bit of a trick that you may not know who they are fully. Because I'm in the United States, and it's, it's getting to be, it feels like sometimes a very dangerous country, you um, be careful. Like if you don't know fully, like I've had narcissistic neighbors where I was a little, they were, they felt scary and I didn't feel safe um, bringing stuff up to them because I didn't know what kind of weaponry or anything they had. And so I didn't, I wouldn't push it. I would either, if I had to involve a homeowner association or law enforcement or some other organization, I would, or I'd let it go because it, it or I'd move. Um, so neighbors can be incredibly impactful, but again, it's radical acceptance. It's realistic expectations. So I once did have a very narcissistic neighbor who would passively aggressively punish by always parking in the only parking spot there was in front of the house, do it over and over and over again, would complain, roll his eyes. He was an awful person. So I did something that was a little bit manipulative. I don't, oh, 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 oh. And even better yet, he would throw his trash over, so it was like a, a very close together houses, and he would throw his trash over the wall of to where I was living, so the trash would be in the yard, and it was gross because like it was his food and things like that, and he felt like a little unhinged. So I thought I'm gonna just try one thing because I I was actually a little afraid, and I do knew he, I knew he had firearms too, so it was not a risk I was willing to take. So you can, this is where you're going to think like, okay, Dr. Romney, maybe we shouldn't read your books. You're not all there. But what I did, that's why this neighbor question made me think of it, because he was clearly narcissistic. He was mean to the other neighbors. He had no empathy. He was very entitled, blah, 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 blah. Very noisy cars, and he'd gun them late at night and all that. But he, um, I, I, it was holiday time. It came to the holiday time. So I... I put together a little gift of like cookies and some sweets and some tea and I gift wrapped it and I gave them to everyone in the neighborhood. So it didn't look like wacky, but I'm like, you know, from your neighbors, love, da, 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 da. I hope you have the most beautiful, joyful holiday season. It was like the Grinch, y'all. This case, it was one of those times where I still think he was narcissistic, but I think he was sort of like a vulnerable, <clears throat> malignant narcissist, whatever that was. He left a note at the door. He's like, no one's ever given me a present and a note like that. He was still an awful person, but he never did the garbage and the parking thing again. So you know what? I'm not telling you, though, who was asking this question, whether you should leave them a holiday gift. But there's funny how there's some little ins there. This happened to work this time. I've had other neighbors where it has not. But um, it's a real, real concern. It's a tremendous stress. You may not have the same strategies at play. One thing I would highly recommend is talk to other neighbors because sometimes you almost create a coalition of other healthy neighbors. Maybe together you can come up with a solution, but at least you might also feel supported. Remember, the support of other people matters. In that case of the garbage neighbor, he hated the other neighbors on the other side of him too, and I ended up becoming their friends. So we, by drawing together, I didn't feel as insane, and they... Um, and in and they they sort of chuckled when I, I told them about the gift. But and then the person moved, so it was fine. Um, other uh, other questions. <coughs> mm. How do you know if you fully accepted the reality of the narcissistic relationship? You know, to this question, I say, I don't know that we ever get a hundred percent there, but I think we can get into the high nineties, ninety sevens, and ninety eights. How do you know that? You don't get surprised. I really think that might be one of the strongest spaces. It doesn't mean you don't get sad. It doesn't mean you don't get hurt. But when they do their narcissistic thing, you don't get surprised. You're like, of course. And you kind of feel that, like, again, it's more of a grief, sad, grudging acceptance. But it's not the, I can't believe they did did this, right? That's when you, you know, you haven't fully accepted because if you fully accepted, you would not have been surprised. And when you have that kind of surprised reaction, it's a little bit sympathetically nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, e sort of unsettling. But if we can sort of stay on the, um, on that sort of, uh, not being surprised, but still being sad, it doesn't mean you don't have any reaction. I also don't want you to think radical acceptance means we have no reaction. Of course we have a reaction. We're human beings. We're hurt. We're angry. We're sad. I mean, those are those are normal reactions to, to somebody behaving badly. But surprise, no. Because that really means that you did not think this would happen. And 
when you really don't think it will happen, then it means you didn't fully understand the depth and breadth of this. So I think that's a real ringer on this. And But don't think that they're fully accepting means that you don't feel those other things, those other negative emotions. It's just that not feeling surprised is usually a good sign. Other questions. Will I ever have that sense of innocence back? I miss the extremely hopeful me. I hate to take this away from you, but mm -hmm, not fully, not fully. I have to say that the one of the great losses of the narcissistic relationship is the loss of innocence, the sense of possibility in anyone you could meet that, that people are all inherently good, that you could take chances with people. Um, that goes. And, and sometimes terrible things had to happen to get us to that place, right? So for some folks, that loss of innocence happens in childhood. If you had a narcissistic parent and you realize like, wow, they really just didn't care, did they? They would say those things and they just didn't care. It may not have registered as that then, but as you come into adulthood and it, it really thuds, you're like, ugh, if that's what could happen there then. So I think that the, that pure mountain stream, clear innocence, it goes don't know that it ever comes back. I don't know that you ever wanted to fully come back because that kind of open, wide-eyed innocence is, a, there's a certain lack of discernment there. I think hopefulness can meet that world of discernment in the sense of we meet a person, we get to know a person, and it's like unfurling, like letting go of rope little by little. Like you might see someone on a boat, they're giving up more and more of the rope so the boat can get away from the dock and then the boat goes off and takes all the rope with it. But it's a, that extremely hopeful you sometimes can be a, 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 a not discerning you. And where that hopefulness can sometimes show up in its most dangerous form is when we, we meet, we meet someone and say, no, 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 I, I can, we can make this work. We can figure this out. And it just doesn't work that way. It's that it's really after we've been through this hard, we have to slow way down and we have to pay attention to what's happening. And we move very tentatively. We move very tentatively. Remember what I say about the thin, walking on thin ice with the cat on the bed, very careful steps, not the kind of big messy dog bounding in and not caring if like, whether the floor is going to hold or not, right? But the mistake falling through that thin ice can kill you. And that's where I think that I don't know that that full wide-eyed innocence ever comes back. I think it's one of those griefs that we always carry with us after a narcissistic relationship. But that hopefulness is something that as you get more and more information about a person, that the hopelessness sort of evolves almost like a sculpture you're putting together clay piece by clay piece, rather than starting with all of the hopefulness there. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a developed hopefulness as you get to know someone and you say, hmm, okay, then this happened, okay, and then that happened. And it, it, it sort of evolves instead of you walk in and expect it's going to be good. It's almost like giving a stranger $100 and thinking they're going to pay it back. They might. They probably won't. And um, don't, don't, don't give them $100 till you know about them is, is my point. So I, I think that my concern would be that people who try to rush back, and, and there's a real issue with some people who are going through healing from narcissistic abuse who engage in the spiritual bypassing, like just all the positivity stuff, and, and they don't actually understand how all of this works. And there's a real danger to go all in on that. And then because th that wide-eyed innocence feels so good, it feels good to view that world that way. If you're too driven by that, there's a very much a danger that you're like, I'm going to ignore all this narcissism stuff and then go right back to that place and then have this happen again. I do think, though, that I know so that people who go through this end up meeting very, very good people who renew our faith, who renew our hope. It'll always be a cautious hope, but the hope comes back. But like I said, instead of a pay in advance hope, it's a let's see how this goes and I'll, 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 I'll pay you out slowly kind of thing. And you'll add to that the sort of the bricks in the wall of hope will happen slowly over time. I'm going to try one or two more questions. There are 11, oh, 11 copies of 90 feet of five people on the waiting list. That speaks volumes as to the prevalence of the number of, that actually really makes me so sad. I almost want to send them a 12th copy and find out where this library is. Um, I am, I am, it, this is it's a funny book to have written because I wanted it to succeed because I oh, guys, I'm not free of ego, right? I wanted it to do well. I wanted I wanted the word about this to get out. I'm pissed. I'm pissed off that 
we we took this long to talk about it. It's 20 freaking 24. Okay. We've no, I mean, you know what though, in the same breath, I can say it's only in the last 25 years we've really understood trauma, right? When I went to graduate school, which was um, 1990s, um, early 1990s, when I went to graduate school, we did not talk about trauma as a somatic process at all, not at all. Uh, Judith Herman's book came out in 1992. And so and that still had not found its way into the curriculum of my graduate program. So it, these things take time. And I think about, I had to go back and re-educate myself on everything about trauma in all the years post PhD, post licensure, post clinical training, all of that. It, this is similar. And that really, really saddens me. Oh, I wish I could get them a 12th copy. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we figure out a way, BJ, if you email us and say I'm the person from the live. And I mean, we could do the one book may not make a difference, but it could. If you could maybe send us an email and tell us you were the person on the live, I'd be happy to send them actually even five more books if they'd accept them. So I'm happy to do that because I'm going to do anything I can on my side of the street to because that might might open it up a little. So yeah, we'd be willing to do that. Anybody else have any one more question? How common is it for therapists to misdiagnose co covert narcissists when they go to therapy? So common, uh, I would say over 50%. I'm guilty of that. Because remember, when we're talking about covert narcissism, there's two things happening here. There's the co this covert narcissism thing of they're really, they've really done a beautiful job of covering it up. They come off as charming and grandiose and like, oh, therapists, like you're not, you know, you're, look, I, I in fact, I once worked with a covert, like this sort of masked narcissist, covert narcissist. And at the time I had like a normal person's office and had the diplomas and like, oh yeah, th those are some good schools. Like you, you must be really smart. So they were trying to fluff me up. And I, you know, depending on where the therapist is at, that can actually kind of work. I think that as therapists, we are trained to look for symptomatology, not personality. So if a person comes into therapy, says, hey, I'm really anxious, I'm having problems in my marriage, or I'm having troubles in my job, or I'm really sad and I can't get out of bed, the therapist is going to, they're going to go in on that anxiety, they're going to go in on that depression, on the identifiable behaviors, what we call a presenting problem. They're, the narcissistic person isn't going to come into therapy saying, hey, I'm actually wrecking everyone's life. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, like I'm kind of charming and charismatic and cool, but I am also wrecking everyone's life. Like they're not going to come in and give that story. So I think when a narcissistic person comes in as very socially skilled, they are, um, especially if they're smart and they're, they're articulate and they are warm with the therapist and seem like a really nice person with the therapist, in essence, are kind of love bombing the therapist, they will definitely get misdiagnosed. Now, the other time that the term covert narcissism is used is when we're talking about vulnerable narcissism, victimized, resentful, sullen, passive aggressive, socially anxious, narcissistic folks. They're almost always misdiagnosed. And they're usually misdiagnosed as having mood disorders, anxiety. I shouldn't say misdiagnosed. They are diagnosed as having mood disorders, anxiety disorders, that kind of thing. And that may be true. But what gets missed is the co-occurring narcissism. And it's often really, really hard to therapist credit here. It's often hard for us to pick up those, what we call negative affectivity patterns, depression and anxiety in a vulnerable narcissist, because they're all so smushed up together. And we're all, again, we're always going to focus on the syndromal thing we can address. Usually in eight to 12 weeks, we can make a lot of progress with anxiety or depression. The problem is 12 weeks in, if the person kept coming, we're like, nothing's happening. You know, you're like, it's like, okay. And then you go through the whole, maybe I'm not a good therapist. Maybe I didn't do that part of the therapy right. I maybe might go seek out supervision or consultation. Another eight to 12 weeks, it's not getting better. It's always, what was me? What was me? What was me? I'm like, huh? By about that week 12, and they're still saying, what was me? That's when the therapist should, if not sooner, six to eight weeks in, should start entertaining about whether there is this sense of, so the, the vulnerable covert narcissism sort of lurking. But to your prime, your prime question here, it, the, all the time, I think most people, most therapists do not account for personality <coughs> in, <coughs> in diagnostic formulation or in treatment planning. We don't. It's not what we were trained to do. Mm. It's a real shame because it's like ignoring that a house <coughs> is being built on a swamp or being built on a leaking oil or something because <coughs> maybe you can still build the house, but it's not going to stay. And 
<clears throat> That's really the issue. So <coughs> I'm so sorry. So your questions are magnificent. If, if, if anyone have any ideas for lives you would like to see, we're doing another live tomorrow. This is me and the New York Times list in a very toxic relationship because as long as this is going, I'm going to keep doing this, keep buying the book, and I guess then it's going to keep happening. But um, Or someone's going to keep buying the book. I wish that person's library would keep buying the damn book. So anybody have ideas for what you want to see lives in the coming days? If not, <coughs> I got a bucket full of topics. But like I said, otherwise, it's going to be my choice. Any other thoughts on topics? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Protect, that's a great one. It's protecting ourselves emotionally when we can't distance. That's a great one. We can't distance. Any others? Mimicking. Hey, Georgia, can, if you don't mind putting in a, another comment, do you mean them mimicking us or us mimicking them? I think you mean them mimicking us. I wish I could see your head nod. I'm going with that. But then if you don't give me the clarification, I'll give it on both sides. Narcissist mimicking. Healed. Okay. Well, I could talk about that. Narcissism and healing. And Aha. Uh -huh, this is a good one. I'm going to add to that one. The person who just said the high functioning narcissist. I'm not only going to say the high functioning narcissist. I'm going to talk about the self, um, the self-aware narcissist. Because let me tell you, that's its own, that's its own comedy show calling you crazy. Yep. That's part of gaslighting. And we'll talk about that dynamic. Porn addiction. Good one. Porn addiction, sex addiction, and trust. Let's do this. Got it. Projection. I wish you were all my students when I was teaching school. Um, sibling estrangement. Oh, shoot. You know what? Someone else had to ask me about siblings. They put siblings at the top because that's the one topic I didn't get to today. Any others? Try one more. And then, ah, the capable of love. I love all of you. My gosh, your questions are so smart. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the mimicking us. Awesome. All right. And you know what? We're going to do this again tomorrow. I'm going to have to sit with my calendar um, and my um, team to figure out what time it's going to be at. Again, your questions are just at such a high level. People who've been doing this for a long time don't ask questions at this level. So it's amazing. Take that to heart because it means you're getting it. And if you're getting it, you're healing. And I am, thank you so much for your support. Remember, order the book by midnight. If you haven't already, you're still going to get the goodies like the live retreat, get entered into that raffle, which I'm going to be doing teas with Dr. Romney for a long time. I'll do them until I'm 90 years old. If that's how long this book is hanging out, that I promise you. I'm going to keep that promise and other fun things in the raffle and all of that. So I look forward to doing another live tomorrow. And again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for this amazing community. Thank you for your questions. I'm actually really excited to just sort of sit down and think about these ahead of tomorrow. And then we'll put up, we'll let you know the time as soon as we figure one out. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.